Now the Carolina Panthers have gone through the draft and free agency, which players have benefited from the most from those moves and which players are now on the roster bubble. I'll tell you right here on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, your team every day. That's our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, and be sure to follow me. Julian Council on Twitter, at Julian Council, where the weekly Friday mailbag is back this Friday, either at me or DM me if you'd like to participate in this week's edition of the weekly Friday mailbag right here on Locked on Panthers. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. All right, the Carolina Panthers have wrapped up the NFL draft. They've also wrapped up the bulk of free agency. Now I understand that general manager Scott Fitter and head coach Frank Reich did say that, all right, we still got some roster holes to fill. Getting a veteran edge rusher opposite of Brian Burns would be nice. Getting a swing tackle would also be something they should probably look into. For the most part, they've gone out there, got their five draft picks. They signed a couple, not a couple, but a decent amount of UDFAs. And they've gone out and got the key pieces to fill the roster holes back in March during free agency, at least the first part and really the bulk of free agency so we've seen all that come and go now I feel like this week we should take some time to evaluate the Panthers roster where they stand in the NFC South where certain players stand here in Carolina whether they're going to make the initial 353 man roster and you'll hear this term thrown out there the roster it's fluid it's ever evolving it's never going to be completely set as I mentioned initial 53 man roster so we have plenty of time to break that down let's do that this week as we look at the Panthers post to 2023 NFL draft. And on today's show, let's look at the winners and the losers from the draft and free agency for the incumbent players here in Carolina. We'll start off on the positive aspect, talking about the winners from free agency and the draft here in Carolina. The first one I think of is Jeremy Chin. We have talked about this the last couple of years. What is Jeremy Chin's natural position? You think back to his rookie year back in 2020 when he had to play linebacker out of necessity and when Trey Boston was still here in Carolina, he was outstanding. 100 tackles that season. You think back to the Minnesota game, we had back-to-back touchdowns. He should have been the NFL Defensive Rookie of the Year instead of Chase Young, who had his fifth-year option decline last week. And speaking of fifth-year options, we get into who had theirs decline on Monday here on the show later on. But Jeremy Chin has been an outstanding player for the Carolina Panthers. Last year is the only time he's really dealt with injuries in Carolina, having a hamstring that kept him out for about six, seven games. When he's been available, he's been really good. The only other players in franchise history to have 100 tackles in their first two years are Luke Keekley, who's going to Canton, and John Beeson, who was an excellent linebacker here at the Carolina Panthers and later on in his career with the New York Giants. Jeremy Chin, he's right there with those guys as far as playmakers here in Carolina on the defensive side of the ball where we've had a ton. And I'm really excited now with Von Bell, who was a captain in Cincinnati, here playing safety, which is Von Bell's natural position. Chin can now play closer up to the box, could play a big nickel, could play some linebacker if you need him to. And you look at the roster right now with only Shaq and Frankie the two inside linebackers that you really trust, and Frankie could play a little outside linebacker. Maybe Jeremy Chin gets to get more reps at inside linebacker this season. But the great thing is, with the Jero Vero being here, this new 3-4 scheme, you can utilize one of your most versatile defensive players, most versatile players on a roster, period, in so many other aspects than what you did, I guess, the last two years when he had to play safety when you moved off of guys like Justin Burris, who was a backup last year, and then when you moved off of Trey Boston. Now Jeremy Chin can play in a position that better suits him and also better suits the Panthers to have the best defense they possibly can have. So he's certainly a winner. You usually wouldn't say that a guy who's coming in and effectively in a way, but not really taking his job and taking the position that he's playing. You usually wouldn't say the person who's no longer going to play that position is a winner, but in this situation, Jeremy Chin and the Panthers as a whole are big winners. The other one I think about is Bradley Bozeman. 
Dude did not get paid anything last year, had to work his way to be a starter, and I thought he was going to be a starter. And I really thought he was going to be one of the key cogs on his offense, which he turned out to be once Pat Elfline went down with that season-ending hip injury, and Bradley Bozeman paved the way for what was one of the best rushing attacks in the second half of the season in the NFL. He gets rewarded with a three-year, $18 million deal, which is still shockingly low for a player who is as good as Bradley Bozeman is. I talked to Kevin Ostrek, or fellow, fellow Elon alum and the host of Locked On Ravens uh, the other day on Locked On NFL, which he hosts on Mondays. And we were just talking about Bozeman and how he got out of Baltimore, which is crazy because he was a really good player there. And apparently the Ravens, they stopped negotiating with a lot of their players so they don't get a deal done in the season. And they decided just to move off of Bozeman. And he comes to Carolina, has a great year, and somehow the Panthers get him for what seems like a real good bargain for someone who's been a very, very solid player at center and at guard back in Baltimore and now here in Carolina. He's a big winner because he wins a center job. Pat Offline, he's no longer here. He gets paid, probably not as much as he um, should have been paid. But here's the thing. He goes out there, has another good season. It's only $10 million guaranteed. It's this year's fully guaranteed and $4 million of his contract in 2024 is guaranteed. Maybe they decide to restructure. Maybe he could renegotiate, get more money if he goes out there, has an all-pro or Pro Bowl season, which I think Pro Bowl, he's certainly capable of doing. Bradley Bozeman is the unquestioned leader right there in the center of that offensive line as Carolina Panthers center and some of the organization decided to invest in for the next three years. Not as much as I feel like they really should have, but it worked out this offseason. Bradley Bozeman here to stay in Carolina. He's a big winner. And again, the Carolina Panthers were a big winner with him coming back in free agency. Derek Brown. He's a huge winner as well. You think about Deshaun Williams coming in here, Shai Tuttle coming in with this new scheme. They can take the pressure off of Derrick Brown, who had his best year of his career. You think early on when he was here, when KK Short only played about, what, three games back in 2020 with the shoulder injury, and Derrick Brown really had a lot of pressure to try and maintain and hold down uh, the interior defensive line that year. Then the year after that, he had da Daquan Jones with him and Jones went on to Buffalo after that season, but still he never really had that much of a veteran presence next to him in his first couple of seasons, but he had to be thrown into the fire. It took his lumps. There was some criticism from a lot of fans about, Hey, Derek Brown, it took you seventh overall. What's going on here last year. The dude was a stud. And because he was a stud, the Carolina Panthers decided on Monday to exercise fifth-year option, which is going to pay him $11.6 million in 2024, telling him that you are one of the cornerstones of this defense. He's also a winner. The Panthers could have traded him. At the deadline last year, they could have traded him when they traded DJ Morton to Chicago at number one. No, they decided, Derek Brown, we want to build around you. We want you to be there in the middle of our defensive line. But we're also going to get you some help. We're going to get you a guy in Shai Tuttle who's young, who's also started in the NFC South, in the NFL, who's been a productive player. We're going to put him next to you for the next couple of seasons. We're going to bring in a veteran player, Deshaun Williams, who understands the system, who can help you along as you continue to mature in your fourth season as one of the leaders on this defense. Derek Brown is absolutely a winner for the Carolina Panthers this offseason. Eddie Pinheiro, I was talking about, let's do a competition. Pinheiro, after that nightmare day in Atlanta where he should have had the drive through that awful traffic, that stretch from 85 um, from Charlotte to Atlanta, he should have had to drive through that just to understand the pain that all of us felt that afternoon when he blew that game in Atlanta. What is it really just him, DJ Moore, who's now not a Panther anymore? We can admit that. Don't take your helmet off, dude. But either way, Eddie Pinheiro's got to make those kicks. You're paid to make those kicks. Didn't make those kicks. After that, didn't miss a kick. And Zane Gonzalez, as good as he was for the Carolina Panthers, he could not stay healthy. And it's so unfortunate for Zane, but now Zane is in San Francisco. But I believe the 49ers drafted a kicker, so he might not actually have that job in San Francisco. But Eddie Pinheiro has a job here in Carolina in large part because of how well he kicked after that Falcons game, but also because Chris Tabor's here in Carolina as special teams coordinator. He's done a really good job to turn around the special teams unit, and Eddie Pinheiro has been a part of that as a solid place kicker for the Carolina Panthers. Eddie Pinheiro getting that two-year deal He's a winner from this offseason as the Panthers choose him and not Zane Gonzalez. And I'm going to throw this one out here. Bryce Young. Yeah, he's not an incumbent Panther like the rest of the guys I'm going to talk about here on today's show, but he's a young quarterback who's coming into an organization that has Frank Reich as his head coach, has Josh McCown as his quarterback coach, Thomas Brown, who's coming from Los Angeles, having worked with Sean McVay the last couple seasons as his offensive coordinator. Sean Jefferson also was there in Los Angeles with Brown 
and with McVay. You have Parks Frazier, who called plays last year under interim head coach Jeff Saturday when Frank Reich was fired in Indianapolis. You have Jim Caldwell, who worked with Peyton freaking Manning, who's in here as a senior offensive assistant, and basically Frank Reich's right-hand man, and like, I don't even know, shadow boss? I don't know what exactly he's doing here. You have a great offensive line, and you've added depth to that offensive line through the draft with Zavala. You are coming in a situation where you have a ready-made staff for a young quarterback. You have an offensive line that will protect a young quarterback. They went out there. They added a receiver in Jonathan Mingo in the draft. They went out and got veterans in Adam Thielen and DJ Shark. They brought in Demir Bird. They have tried to rebuild this wide receiver core. They brought in a pass-catching tight end, something that Teddy Bridgewater didn't have, something that Sam Darnold didn't have. He had it for like a couple of weeks, something that uh, Baker Mayfield also did not have in Carolina. You now have that. So Bryce Young's a winner because – he came into the best situation any of these rookie quarterbacks in this past draft could have come into. So Young is a winner because he's here in Carolina in this organization actually has their head on straight for the first time in a long time. And kudos to you, David Tepper, for getting it right. Finally. So those are the winners so far from free agency and the draft here in Carolina. Again, free agency still ongoing. Some of this might change. I don't think it's going to change for Jeremy Chin, Bradley Bozeman, Derek Brown, Eddie Pinheiro, or Bryce Young. So those are the winners. Now, who are the guys who lost out based off of the moves the Panthers made during free agency and the draft? I'll tell you here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. But before we get there, guys, did you watch Steph Curry? On Sunday afternoon in Sacramento, the dude went off in Charlotte's own. Very excited, by the way, to have Bryce Young here. Called him QB1 before game six on Friday night. Uh, but go over to FanDuel, official sports betting partner here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now, new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuelSportsbook.com slash locked on and get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. We got winners. We also have losers here in Carolina from this offseason, which is still ongoing. But for the most part, all the roster moves that are going to be made ahead of OTAs and in training camp have been made here in Carolina. Now, who are the losers from the draft and free agency here over the last couple of months? Well, let's start off with the one who is very obviously the biggest loser here in Carolina. Not He's not a loser, but he's the biggest loser based off of what's happened within his position group, and that's Matt Corral. When the Panthers brought in Andy Dalton, you knew right then and there that Dalton was going to be the bridge, that he would be the backup quarterback in Carolina. And when you see that he can make up the $17 million in incentives, that lets you know for doggone sure that he's going to be the backup and maybe even start a couple games until that rookie quarterback who was unnamed at the time was ready to go. Then when you trade up to number one on March 10th, you knew for sure the Carolina Panthers were going to take a quarterback and they were likely to get that quarterback out on the field as soon as possible. And again, Andy Dalton was going to be the mentor and the backup. So there's not a bigger loser right now here in Carolina as far as what happened this offseason within their position room than Matt Corral, who the Panthers traded up in the third round last year when a panic move, when trade talks with Cleveland for Baker Mayfield fell through, Scott Fitter and that organization decided, all right, mainly David Tepper, I imagine. Okay, we got to get a quarterback. We have to do something. And then right after the draft said, yeah, we're going to bring Matt along slowly. And we need to still bring in more competition. Like Matt Corral was never competition for Sam Darnold. Baker Mayfield ended up being that competition. And when you hear that, you wonder, why in the world did you trade up for the guy when you really didn't have much interest in playing him at all last season? Now, unfortunately for Matt Corral, he breaks his foot on that cursed turf up there, or is it really grass, that cursed field at Gillette Stadium in New England, the same field that took Cam Newton away from us. And it took Matt Corral away from ever having an opportunity in Carolina. Because certainly I would have thought last season, Maybe he gets a chance. Or is it possible that when Sam Darnold came back, he was always going to be the guy? I don't really know. Uh, you can go find the other timeline and figure out what actually would have happened had Corral not getting injured. But it's unfortunate for him that he never got an opportunity to play in Carolina and to show what he can do because it's certainly over for him now. 
I've had people ask, well, can, why can't you just treat Matt Corral and Bryce Young both as rookie quarterbacks? David Tepper just said that he thinks Bryce Young gives him the highest probability of the guys he just drafted to help them win Super Bowls. That Bryce Young's going to come and be the number two. That's what Frank Reich said. They want Bryce to come and learn the offense. He's going to be their guy. So there is no competition. Yes, he's going to have to earn his spot. He can't go out there and completely suck and think he's going to be able to start at all this season. He's going to go out there, play well, grab the offense, and be a leader on this roster. But for Matt Corral, it's over. And I saw that Matt Corral apparently went to Instagram, as people must do nowadays, go to social media and air their grievances instead of just being mature about it. And I guess talking about how he wasn't wanted and yada, yada, yada. It's just wild to me because he knew March 10th the Carolina Panthers were going to take a quarterback. And he waited 48 days. To put that out there, if you want to put that out March 10th, okay, I get it. But to wait for 48 days, stewing on that, your agent's talking about, hey, he's up to 220, he's ready to compete, and then you're going to do that? All right, cool, Matt Corral. Just makes sense that you should try to come here, work as hard as you can, and then hopefully you can be the backup once Andy Dalton's contract's up in two years and in your final year here in Carolina. Right now, it doesn't look like Matt Corral really uh, is falling in line with the team. Now, we'll see. It's just social media. We've seen other things like that before, like Robbie Anderson, and how did that work out for him in Carolina? So I don't know. Matt Corral certainly uh, a massive loser this offseason with Bryce Young and Andy Dalton now coming in here to play quarterback. Shai Smith, another one of those. Wide receiver room. We talked about it being rebuilt now that DJ Moore is in Chicago. You still have Terrace Marshall, who's in the same draft class as Shai Smith, and you would think right now you'd pencil him in as the third wide receiver on opening day with Adam Thielen, with DJ Chark. You got Lovishka Chenault in there. You got Jonathan Mingo in there. You got Demir Bird. There's, and they got a lot of dudes in that wide receiver room. And Thielen's on the roster. Chark's on the roster. I think Terrace is on the roster. I mean, what we saw from him last year, you imagine he's going to take another step. Now he's actually finally healthy for a full offseason. So those three guys on the roster. Talking to Mike K last week from the Charlotte Observer, Chenault's going to be on the roster. I don't think that they uh, drafted Mingo in the second round to cut him, so there's five. It's going to be between Shai Smith and Demir Bird. And Demir Bird, someone who's been a veteran, who's played here in Carolina before, not for this staff, but he's had success in the league. We saw what happened when he went through our secondary looking like Swiss cheese last year in Atlanta in that game that Pinheiro and DJ Moore blew. He's probably going to be your sixth guy, and he also can give you something return-wise. Shai Smith, we saw last year, when it came to the return game, especially trying to field punts, really struggled at it. And I really questioned why on earth are we still doing this Shai Smith? Shai Smith, fifth rounder a couple years ago, the staff that brought him in, no longer here. Yes, the general manager who did it is here. You know, the Panthers were one of the worst receiving cores last year. Receiving core is better than it was a year ago. It's still not going to be considered one of the top ones in the NFL. Shai Smith is probably the bottom of the depth chart. And right on the roster bubble. So he certainly is a loser after the Carolina Panthers brought in not just Thielen and Shark and Bingo, but really Demir Bird, who's competing with his fellow South Carolina Gamecock. Uh, this one, I'm not quite sure if he's actually a loser, but Brady Christensen, I'll throw it out there. Christensen, of course, injured his ankle in week 18, the same day Austin Corbett towards ACL, which is going to cost him a couple games in a regular season. Brady Christensen on what was a really good offensive line according to our friend Mike K last week, is probably the weakest link. Not saying that he was bad. He was fine, but was he the best they could do at that position? Well, they certainly have shown that they have interest in guys like Cade Mays, who right now you would say would be the week one starter at right guard. And will Mays, if he plays well, be pushed out of the position and out of the starting lineup? Will there be a competition? It seems like they're, we're headed to a competition where Cade Mays could be competing with Brady Christensen at left guard. You could look at Chandler Zavala, who just was drafted in the fourth round at NC State, who's a really good player and has chemistry, having played only five games because of an injury back in 2021 next to Iki Iquano. But him and Iki, those guys are tight. That's his boy. And that's a lot of girth, man. At 322, I could see Brady Christensen maybe getting squeezed to being the swing tackle in Carolina. And that's not really the worst case scenario. It's his third year. He's got another year after this. So having two years, Brady Christensen as a guy who can either rotate as a swing tackle or be a starter on the interior. You don't hate that. Does Brady want that? Of course not. But he's got a lot of competition now with Cade Mays. And the thing too, of Corbett, because they went out there and renegotiated, his, we're not really restricted his contract. He's going to be starter right guard whenever he comes back this season. 
Then again in 2024, Christensen, he's going to be battling for his job there at left guard against Mays and Zavala. So he is someone who, hey, iron sharpens iron, but he's someone who's going to have to really compete to hold on to that job. So I look at him in a way as a loser as they brought in some guys and they already had a guy on the roster who could really push him and possibly squeeze him out of being the starting left guard here in Carolina. Now, the, probably the second biggest loser here in Carolina this offseason, CJ Henderson. Found out on Monday, not a surprise to anyone who's watched him play the last two years here in Carolina, that he did not have his fifth-year option exercise, which would have paid him $11.5 million. He's not worth $11.5 million based off what he's how he's performed so far here in Carolina and in the NFL through his first three years. But it's not just that. The Panthers brought in Eric Rowe, who about to be 30 years old, an older player, but he started in Miami and New England. He's someone the Panthers clearly felt like they needed to add another cornerback, a veteran in this room, having seen Dante Jackson really struggle with injuries the last couple of seasons. And then J.C. Horn also have some sort of injury issues too, but not nearly as bad and as concerning as we'd say with Dante coming off that Achilles. That they know they had to go out there and get another corner. Yeah, you have Keith Taylor still here. You got Stan Thomas Oliver still here. You got other couple corners. But then you had Jamie Robinson, who can be filling that nickelback role that Miles Hartsfield's now vacating now that he's in San Francisco. And there, the talk was last year, okay, C.J. Henderson looking really good during training camp. It, it could this secondary go from good to great? I, I had a podcast episode. Is C.J. Henderson the key for the Panthers going from a good secondary to one of the elite secondaries in the NFL? As we found out, no. That was very much not the case. We saw week one, the way he played against Cleveland and throughout the rest of the season, especially culminating in the meltdown week 17 in Tampa. C.J. Henderson ain't it, y'all. Unfortunately, at least he has not been it. And it's possible. Now, here in Carolina, with this new cornerback coach and D'Angelo Hall, I forget I forget who the, who the main cornerback coach is, unfortunately. Um, with the new secondary coaches here, it's possible that it finally clicks for him. It's also now a contract here. So maybe his head's on straight and he's ready to go and compete. But he's in a position where he might not get that much burn and the Panthers just might kind of cut their losses and say, hey, CJ, we gave you a shot. Didn't really work out. So he's also someone I'm looking at that did not benefit from the Panthers moves this offseason. So Matt Corral, who man, tough for him. Shy Smith, Brady Christensen, sort of, maybe not. And CJ Henderson, those are the guys I'm looking at as the biggest losers from free agency and the draft for the Carolina Panthers over the last couple of months. I've mentioned it so far on the show. Derek Brown, CJ Henderson, Panthers had to make a decision by Monday what to do with their fifth-year options. Derek Brown, here's $11.6 million. CJ Henderson, no, you're in a contract here. What's your future? We'll talk about it here in just a moment on Locked On Panthers. When the Carolina Panthers started off the 2021 season 3-0, we were on fire, y'all. We were fired up. Sam Darnold had showed us a ton in that second half when Christian McCaffrey had pulled his hamstring, which would cost him pretty much the majority of the rest of that 2021 season. We saw Sam Darnold guide that team, lead that team, really look great against a bad Texas team, but he looked like a player who was going to take that next step and potentially be the guy here in Carolina in that second half in Houston. Unfortunately, in that second half in Houston, the Carolina Panthers lost J.C. Horn. Their first-round draft pick, the first defensive player taken in the 2021 draft, the guy they decided to take instead of taking a quarterback like Justin Fields or Mac Jones. They believed in J.C. Horn and his ability to be a lockdown guy, which he has been and what he was early on in that season, especially against New Orleans. Having that interception look great in that game in week two where the Panthers dominated the COVID-depleted Saints. Didn't matter, COVID or not, Saints are getting their ass kicked that afternoon at Bank of America Stadium. The Panthers were in a position where, okay, we're 3-0. and We got a quarterback who's looking pretty good right now. It's, let's go win it. Let's go try and win this division. So because of the 3-0 and start and the injury to J.C. Horn, the Carolina Panthers decided to do a move that illustrated to a lot of us that Oh, okay, okay. They're they're kind of all in on this 3-0 start by trading Dan Arnold and a third-round pick to the Jacksonville Jaguars for C.J. Henderson, who had fallen out of favor with Urban Meyer and that new staff. Now, falling out of favor of Urban Meyer in Jacksonville, uh, you would honestly kind of think, hey, that, that's probably a good player you'd want. Anyone that Urban Meyer doesn't want is probably someone that you want because Urban Meyer had no business coaching 
in the NFL, and we all know how big of a disaster that was going to be, and end up being down in Duval with the Jacksonville Jaguars. So enter CJ Henderson comes in week four, plays limited packages against the Dallas Cowboys, and we kind of gave CJ some time. All right, let's wait and see what he can do. We weren't really all that impressed in 2021. Last year, as we were talking about earlier on the show, training camp, Steve Smith Sr. saying, okay, CJ Henderson's out here locking down some dudes. I'm talking about, could the Panthers secondary go from good to great? Overall, with CJ Henderson being that guy where CJ and Dante, they can play on the boundary. You got JC in the slot. Feeling good about that. Come week one, penalty. Come week two, penalty. And it was much of the same that we had saw the year prior with CJ Henderson where just not a reliable player for the Carolina Panthers. Just not the kind of corner that you want to be your third guy. Not someone that you can depend on. And someone who fell out of favor in Miles Hartsfield is playing more in a nickel than J.C. playing there and then C.J. getting to play on the outside opposite of Dante Jackson. That just did not happen. It never materialized. When Scott Fitterer made that trade, he told us this isn't a reactionary move, which it absolutely was. Um, he said it wasn't a reactionary move. It wasn't about we're all in. It's about a move for the future. Well, the future was last season. The future is now, and now we're here in the future. The Carolina Panthers decided that they don't want to give C.J. Henderson Eleven and a half million dollars in 2024. It was an easy and simple decision to make. Derek Brown made all the sense in the world. He's someone that you have had multiple opportunities to trade, much like Brian Burns, and declined to do that. And he's someone who has shown on the field that he is a solid player and is going to be one of your team captains and leaders defensively for the next five plus years. CJ Henderson has not shown that at all. And the Panthers, I don't know how much they took a flyer on him. It's someone that they said they liked. How much of a move is that? With, was it a Matt Rule move? I don't know. All I know is they said it was a move for the future. And the future has come, and the Carolina fans have decided that they do not want C.J. Henderson to be part of their long-term future, that they're not going to guarantee it. That they'll give him this fall, these next 17 games, and after that, we'll see. It was a bad trade. It was a bad decision. And getting to May 1st and deciding to decline his fifth-year option tells you that. And also, watching him play the last two seasons already confirmed it. More so what happened last year in Tampa confirmed that C.J. Henderson is not a guy that you can rely on, at least so far in his career. Now, there is an old saying that contract years are undefeated. And players who have had their options decline have gone out there and had massive contract years. Look at a guy like Hassan Reddick, who in Arizona never really found a way how to fit him in that, de that defense, has a big year, comes to Carolina, has another big year, goes to Philadelphia, has another big year. So it didn't seem to be the player. I don't know if schematically it's been detrimental to CJ Henderson's career, but now with a new coaching staff, could he be someone that benefits from new coaching? Can he be someone who can really step up with Jonathan Cooley and with D'Angelo Hall here as the cornerback coach and be ready to step into this new scheme? I don't know, but it's now or never for CJ Henderson. If he wants to secure his future, not just with the Carolina Panthers, but in the NFL, because it was a guy who was a top 10 pick in that 2020 draft or Jacksonville took him. Of course, the coaches that drafted him, they weren't, they were gone. Same thing with the general manager, Trent Balky, the general manager that had drafted him, they were gone. Balky's now there in Jacksonville. He's not the one who took him. So you have a new coaching staff that doesn't want you. You have another coaching staff, Matt Rule, that, you know, they wanted you. Then Steve Wilkes, he had things to say about CJ's got to do better. And that didn't work out. Now you have another coaching staff. So we're talking about one, two, three, four. This is his fifth coaching staff that he's working with. And the lack of continuity, possibly that hurts him, not having the same coach there. But it's the NFL, and I mean, that's actually the NFL. You have way more continuity, continuity than college because these guys are under contract and really can't be tampered with unless they're going to get a better job. And that does not always happen, especially for secondary coaches. So for CJ Henderson, maybe he's able to find some sort of consistency this year with Cooley and with D'Angelo Hall. But the Carolina Panthers, they let it known on Monday morning how they felt about CJ Henderson. And they felt like, He's not someone, at least right now, worth investing in and in that this is likely his last year here in Carolina. So 
Big year for C.J. Henderson here in 2023 as Carolina Panthers decide to not exercise the fifth-year option on Monday. All right, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, and be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter, at Julian Council, where I'll be back on Friday to answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions, either at me or DM me over on Twitter at Julian Council to get those weekly Friday mailbag questions into me. Now, in the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Wednesday.